Good morning, Jordan. Uh, great to see you again. Um, thank you very much for taking the time um, to chat with me. We have uh, something very big to celebrate, a milestone in the IMB history. What are we celebrating? Hey, Jordan, it's great to talk to you, man. Man, I'm excited to be a return guest. We just hit a billion dollars across our portfolio companies. It's really important to me on a personal basis because at 17, it was a dream to get to a billion dollars. And on a professional basis, man, I want to just share both the strategic approach that we're taking at IMB that enables us to hit it, to talk about the partnership and people strategy we have that enables us to do this at scale, to talk about the systems that we put in place to enable us to monitor and make it work. And then finally, to talk about the impact side of it that brings it all together in terms of the DEI approach and the community approach that we think makes us be a better sort of corporate citizen overall. What are the key components to getting to a billion dollars of revenue across the portfolio? And how, how many years have you and the team been building this? Yeah, I mean, it starts with a dream and a vision, right? And so uh, we use something called an entrepreneurial operating system, both at IMB and throughout our portfolio companies. And what it does is it encourages you to sort of have a five-year, 10-year goal or vision of what type of company you want to build, what type of people you'll need to have, how do you create scorecards, how do you measure on an annual basis, and what will be the accountability and shared vision across. And so we set this as a goal maybe 10 years ago to try to build a whole co with a, a billion dollars of revenue. And it started with the vision. It started with EOS. So the EOS system, I mean, we've... And because of you, I, I picked up that book and really started to dive into it. And actually, we're recording next week with Ross. Super interesting because we are not doing it right. <laughs> you know, it feels like the company just because we're growing, we're hiring two new people. What I found is like we were so focused on clients. Number one, you got to pay the bills and then execute the projects that we were forgetting to sell internally and to give a vision to the team internally. You know, I'm just kind of curious, like how. How have you implemented EOS across your portfolio and internally to really scale the business? Yeah, I think it's a good question. Um, many entrepreneurs, and, and I count myself as the entrepreneur first, have a vision of where they want to be and what type of business they want to build. The most important thing is to try to figure out how to have that vision be a shared vision amongst your team and your partner companies. And what EOS does better than anything I've ever utilized is it creates the discussion space, the continuous meeting, and the continuous pivoting and tweaking of your vision as well as your actions to enable you to always be on the same page and to be moving in a singular vision to what it is your goals are. So how do you balance this tension between your vision, your company, you're the entrepreneur with the team? And yeah. truly having a shared vision versus like, okay, avoiding that kind of mentality of like, okay, I guess I just have to do this to get their vision. But how do you truly synthesize it and live and breathe a shared vision? You have to realize that everybody that comes to work with a company or comes to work with me as an entrepreneur are coming both to be a part of what I see as a vision, but also to be a part of building the business in a way that's in likeness of their vision as well. And so our job is to try to find people who really want to be in the private equity business, who really love building businesses, who meet our culture and fit our values. And if you start there, then it's just a function of how to make sure we make an environment safe enough for people to have open and honest conversation, for people to clarify what is working and is not working, and for people to get immediate feedback on both what success looks like and what failure looks like so we can get better and better on a continuous basis. And I think the EOS system creates a weekly check-in, it creates a quarterly meeting, creates scorecards, and ways to measure people's sort of contributions in a way that helps us all become better. I saw that you recently sold LaFada. How did you implement EOS at LaFada? And what are some like very practical things that this audience can use in their portfolio? We had made an investment business called LaFada Contract Services in January 2018. We immediately sort of, you know, converted the business into a minority-owned business. 
we set out to have a retreat and started to onboard the process of EOS within that company. And it enabled us to focus our vision. So our goal was how do we double or triple the size of the business within one customer? And that was contrary to what conventional business school thinking is and that, you know, we weren't trying to expand across many, many customers because we thought we had so much goodwill and so much pent up demand within our existing customer that all we had to do was make sure we hired the right people, open offices that supported our customer and continue to listen and to hire the right people to support the needs of our one customer. And that resulted in taking a business from 15 to 45 million of revenue and from two to nine of profit in less than four and a half years in a way that created, you know, 27 times return to our investors when we went to sell the business in August of this year. That's really interesting in terms of that decision to go deeper into a customer versus wider into other customers and other services. And we're wrestling with that right now, for example, like we're really good at a few things. And if we just look at video, for example, as a service, you know, there are how many thousands of private equity firms have zero video, but then that trade-off of, do we expand into websites? Cause guess what? I'm tired of referring out fifty hundred thousand dollars websites to our partners when we should be doing that service. But what is that trade-off in 2023 and 2024 of how do you make sure that you create a moat to be that one-stop shop versus making a strategic decision of, no, we just want to be the best damn video providers in private equity, period. Yeah, I think you have to figure out who you want to be. Like For us, going deep with fewer numbers of customers has been a winning strategy. We have customer concentration throughout all of our portfolio companies. And we love it. We understand that stroke of the pen, someone can change and we can one day be out. But we also realize that the more we invest in that customer, it fits fits our values. We say partnership and people first, that equals our customers too. And if we can understand how to better integrate our solutions into where you're going, we're going to be more valuable to you. And when we're more valuable to you, we increase our revenue, we increase our EBITDA, and we build businesses that are safer. Um, and so we prefer a more concentrated approach to value creation and to our customer development. Let's continue to some of the other parts of how you've grown the, as a team to this. And, you know, you know what, what are some of the other key components? So one is you have a scalable system with EOS, but what are some of the other components to your, you know, your team growing this? Again, we just hit the billion dollar mark, man. And when we do the look back, it's really four things that's been driving where we're at. One is people, partnership, a strategic system, and basically a focus area. And on the people side, you know, we start with making sure that we have hired deeper and faster in terms of building out an investment company. We have 16 people on our team. We're bringing on a lady named Lenora Robinson Mills to be our COO to run operations, strategy, and impact. And most people our size, most people as an independent sponsor, they may have eight people, we have 16. And so we built a bigger team to enable us to scale at a much faster and safer way. On the partnership side, when we go and look at for companies, we start with this concept of a two-step buyout. We want them to take some money off the table. We want them to roll over and we want them to be our partner. We say the worst thing they can do is leave. And so we do everything in our willpower to make sure the partners that we partner with, which are typically founder families or their kids, those management teams, the day before, or the day after, they should feel very little change. And our job is to build trust that we're going to help them hit their goals. We're going to give them resources to hire more people. We're going to give them resources to make acquisitions. So partnership and people matter. Systematic approach. We use Entrepreneurial Operating System or EOS across all of our portfolio companies. What it does is it creates a way to establish what the five-year vision is, what a three-year outlook might be, what is our one-year goals, how do we meet on a quarterly basis to assess, how do we have a, a scorecard to assess performance on a weekly basis, how do we have a system met to measure accountability amongst our people, and to make sure it's all shared by all. That systematic approach throughout all of our companies companies enables us to go faster. And then finally, in terms of focus, you know, lots of firms go out 
looking for many, many different things. As a journalist, our approach is to become focused on utilities and government contracting so we can become more of a strategic buyer. When that founding entrepreneur talks to us, they don't just see capital. They see we have access to customers. They see we built out markets similar to what they're trying to do and that they believe we can help them build their business is what a more focused approach to investment strategy enables you to do. So can you kind of help help us kind of work through, you know, the trade-offs that you've had to make, maybe not just on industry focus, but just building this business with your team. What are the big trade-offs that you have had to make? And then looking back two, three, four, five years in the rearview mirror, and how did that play out? It's a, dis- it's a discipline approach. You basically have to go slow to go fast. And what that simply means is that there are many businesses that we saw that were good investments that people made that have won and been highly successful. And our window of which we look at those investment opportunities is not, is it a good investment? It's, is it something that we uniquely can do differently that give us an advantage in owning that business? And if other people can do it just as well as we can do it, we let them do it. Our job is to find the things where we are differentiated. An example, when a minority certified business or a woman certified business or a customer concentrated business approaches us, we start out knowing half of the universe of buyers don't do minority contractors, don't do women owned businesses because they're afraid on exit, they might lose the certification. Business school is taught investors not to buy customer concentrated businesses. So in that situation, we come with at least an open, you know, sort of mindset to see why is this company in business? How sticky is their moat with their customer? And can we build a better business with them? It helps us have a starting advantage because we're receptive. And then we have a proven system of building out those sort of specialty situations that enable us to be a more valuable buyer. So it's not that there's not great businesses in other industries or in in generalist sort of investment strategy. It's simply by knowing we like utilities, knowing we like government contracting, we can build strategic relationships with customers, strategic relationships with suppliers that enable us to be better buyers and also more suitable for companies that have special you know, contracting or certification advantages or disadvantages that others may not like. It's easy to look at headlines like, all right, we got to a billion dollars of revenue. It was an easy road here. But, you know, what are some of the hurdles along this journey that you faced and how did you get thrown? So when you're an unbranded firm where you're small and large corporations, you know, procurement offices, investment banks, or owners of businesses don't know you, you simply have a harder journey to make the case for having that business owner sell you their business, having that bank provide you with bank financing than you would if you were a more scaled business in a branded firm. And so you have to realize that if the average firm gets told no 50 times when going to seek financing, we probably get told no a hundred times. And so we've come to believe that being told no is just part of the business and that we just got to keep going out to try to find the person that's willing to see what we see in terms of an opportunity to understand our underwriting process, to understand why we think it's safe. That's what we've had to do on an institutional basis. The other thing that's sort of unstated is that in the small business, Oftentimes we overlook our friends and our business relationships. And so we have 60 to 70 investors who are people that we did business with, people that we went to college and university with. Those people invest maybe not as much. They may give us $25,000 or $100,000, but they become great ambassadors. They become great sources of deal flow in a way that we are thinking differently and using the network we have to our advantage, if that makes any sense. I think that is such an important point that I've learned in the past two years where 
you know, we did a particular service as part of like a marketing service and at a large company and, you know, an important individual there. And, you know, what do we get? We get a gift basket. Like, wait a second, you just got placed, you know, you're doing well there and tremendous value to the firm. We get a gift basket. I, I got, I got two kids to feed, but now one year later and two years later, you know, these individuals at different firms are like our biggest ambassadors. And it was that, just that I think maturing as a professional, as an individual, realizing that money is just one part of a business relationship. And there's so many different parts about it. And it's actually just focusing on the relationship and the value that comes from just truly trusting each other and the win-win situation and getting away from a transaction mindset. When, you know, when you're trying to pay for diapers and you don't have any money, it's very easy to focus on, is there money being fired in the next two weeks? That's exactly right. And it's interesting just to see, that's really what you're saying is that there's, you know, there's, there's more to life and business than transactions and the financial part of this. Maybe kind of a, a bigger question, which is, how did you even get into this? When does the journey start for you in getting into this career path? Yeah, the journey started first with my parents. They were early buyers of cocktail lounge or a bar when in 1978, when I was eight, nine years old. Uh, we bought a business for $120,000. And, you know, I was lived on top of the bar. I cleaned the parking lot, cleaned the bar on weekends, et cetera, et cetera. In 83, they bought a popcorn business for $330,000. And so I saw them buy, not build two entrepreneurial businesses. And then in 87, there was a gentleman named Reginald Lewis who bought and sold a business called, called Business Patterns. And in 87, I saw a gentleman named Reginald Lewis buy a business called McCall Business Patterns and sold it for like $90 million, made $63 million of gain. And then later in that same year, he bought a business called TLC Beatrice for a billion dollars. These articles were in Jet Magazine and Ebony Magazine profiling him. And I looked at my mom and was like, that looks like a good job. And so from the early acquisition stuff I saw from my parents to the large scale acquisition stuff I saw from Mr. Lewis, I became infatuated with, can I buy businesses and create a billion dollar business? And that's been a dream I had over the last you know, 40 years so, or 45, 42. I became infatuated with trying to buy and build a billion dollar business through acquisitions over the last 40 years. It's not lost on me that I got to the business I'm in by clipping articles on others that were doing acquisitions and also watching my parents do acquisitions. At this seat, my dream and my goal of telling these stories on podcasts and sharing my story broadly through various trade associations and conferences is to make sure other people see that there's a path to being in the private equity business. There's a path to buying businesses that you can do from whatever seat and from whatever journey you start with. I don't have a fund. I have bootstrapped and my first deal, the entrepreneur gave me a seller note to buy their business in 2014. I raised money from friends. I raised money from colleagues in increments of 20,000 and 50,000 and hundred thousand dollars to buy my next few businesses. You can do it at any walk in life, but if you treat people right, if you honor your partnerships, if you develop a strategic focused approach to buying companies, we all can create billion dollar businesses and have impact not only for our personal lives, but for the communities that we care about. Last question is what does IMB look like in two years and five years? Yeah, my dream for IMB for the next three and five years is number one, to you know continue to hire and build out what I consider to be the next generation of talent within our firm. And so we've hired a number of directors and managing directors, and our job is to make them become the stars of the next decade. Number two is to continue to build our strategic moat and utilities and government contracting to where when we partner with the management team or founder, they know that we have a strategic toolkit of helping them build their businesses in a way that's differentiated from other people that they work with. And finally, that we create a more deliberate impact 
model within our businesses. We not only want to create wealth, we not only want to build better businesses, but we want to impact the diversity, equity, and inclusion in the companies. We want to create a more strategic community, you know, sort of commitment in terms of workforce diversity and how we operate within the communities of which we own and operate businesses in a very intentional way. So in three and five years, we'll have built out an impact strategy that's working in the companies and the communities we operate. We'll have developed and created stars within our own company and within our partner companies of next generation of talent. And we'll have created a more strategic approach to utilities and government contracting where we help our customers and we help our partner companies be better because we're associated with them. It turns out To build a great business, you have to focus on the inputs, not the outputs. So if you notice, I'm not focused on how much revenue, how much return we create. I'm focusing on, do we have the right people? Have we built a more strategic approach to utilities and government contracting? Have we developed a more deliberate ESG or DEI approach in terms of the people we hire within our business and the type of impact we have in the communities we operate? If we do those components right, success is going to be easier to come by. And where we grow in terms of size is less important to how strategically important we build our business and the people that we work with.